It's time to talk Houston Texans football on the Our Lads Football Network here on the Our Lads Football YouTube channel. And that means we welcome in this guy, Cole Thompson. How's it going, Cole? Uh, I feel like I'm always on. And now it's for good reason. You know, it used to be because of, holy crap, this team is awful. Now it's like, oh, there's there's positive things to talk about here. There's yeah. there's a lot of good moving forward for this team. There's, you know, there's there's Super Bowl talks. Let's Let's, Crazy, let's temper huh? those expectate let, let, let's temper those expectations Greg if we can just for right now but yeah. we're getting close to it and that's that's that, that, that that's a lot better than the last couple times I've been on here talking about three win seasons oh. so besides that good it's nice to see that uh both yourself and uh my uh Detroit Lions uh, uh insider Jeff Risden uh had very successful uh, long overdue seasons especially Jeff with the lions Jeff immediately. Yeah. Jeff, I've known Jeff since I was 19 years old. So I've known him for over a decade. Wow. And that man, God <laughs> bless his heart. Honestly, yeah. God, God bless lions hearts everywhere about this. Yeah. So hopefully I'll get some loving this year because I'm now I've now taken up the mantle. My team has taken up the mantle as uh, the longest drought postseason ah. in the NFL. So hopefully uh, we'll get over that hump, but this is a Houston Texans, uh, interview and, uh, video, and we're going to talk. Yes. Houston Texans football, uh, with Cole, uh, by the way, Cole, uh, you have uh, your new YouTube channel. Uh, is it Cole Thompson or Mr. Cole Thompson? Mr. Cole Thompson. It's the exact same as my, as my Twitter handle. There you I, go. What's so baffling dude is that like, I'm trying to figure out who is the other Cole Thompson that stole my name. Because if I don't know that many, I've tried getting my handle changed to Cole oh, Thompson wow. on Twitter. Try doing it on YouTube. It's like, oh no, someone's taking it. Who? Because I look it up and I'm like, can I buy the you name? Can't. I'll sell you five bucks. They're like, no, they just don't exist. But you can't have it. All right, cool. I guess that's fine. That sucks. Yeah, that's that's something that the uh, well, you know, they'll come up with something there too. But oh yeah, of course it, they will. It is. It does suck. Okay, uh, so. The Houston Texans draft consisted of nine picks. And by the way, we have seven of the profiles in the draft guide. So yeah. you can, this is still relevant because you can buy this and read about seven of the draft picks. Not sure about free agents, college free agents, but we'll get into that. So seven of them are in this guide. And you also uh, uh, need to remember uh, that the reason I have Cole on here at this time and I'm interrupting him just before he's taking off for va vacation uh, tomorrow. Uh, this draft review guide. Now this is last year's cover. So the draft review guide for our lads.com comes out in about a month. So uh, I'm responsible for uh, going over the Houston Texans and their draft. And Cole's going to help me along with this. All and, right. and guys, make sure that if you're watching this, go ahead and get the, get, go get the, go get the almanac, go get, go get the, the draft guide. They, Greg does great work. Our lads does great work. I, I'm blessed to be able to be the insider for this team. But uh, I, I will say this, the, the, the resources that Greg and the entire staff pull out, it, it's worth your time. So if you have a moment, go ahead and pick up your, our lads, draft almanac draft guide i call it an almanac for some reason I like I don't it. Know. why why am i like was i am i marty mcfly in the 19 in 1985 like honestly like no, you're drinking too much of that stuff yeah now i'm now it's 2015 and i just saw the cubs win the world series which actually almost happened like can you have like like that was something that actually almost came true in the movie which <laughs> yeah, is kind really of, yeah. stupidly funny to me <laughs> Uh, we, we digress. Okay. So, uh, let's now go over the fact that eight of the nine picks, uh, I thought this was interesting. I always try to find something, a pattern, but eight of the nine draft picks all played different positions. That's kind of yeah. rare, uh, offensive line, uh, being the only one. Um, but there were uh, a lot of picks out of the nine. Actually, you had, uh, what, uh, five of them came from round six and round seven. Yeah. So, um, all late picks. Yeah. So that's why, but this is why it's good to uh, have you on because th those are the guys you want to really find out about and what kind of a shot do they have and what are their roles. But let's start at the top. Uh, Kamari Lasseter. Now, he, he, playing for Georgia in the ACC, that's always a good thing. Hey, I've got someone, I got a, def a defender for the Georgia Bulldogs. Well, that's got to be good. Um, but we've seen. I'd say a great many of these Georgia Bulldog players have gone to the NFL and, you know, especially DBs for whatever yeah. reason, 
Georgia DBs in the NFL have not worked out. Um, but what do you like about Lasser and what more importantly do the Houston Texans like about him? So I can tell you that when I was starting to talk to some scouts, just roughly about cornerbacks, I, I knew cornerback was going to be a need for this team. They, they weren't really in the market of getting a long-term deal done with Steven Nelson or they would have done it. Uh, they felt content with bringing in some young guys that have some upside, CJ Henderson being one. Uh, Jeff Akuda was the name that I continuously heard throughout the offseason was going to at least be brought up in discussions, and eventually he signs a one-year kind of prove-it deal. But I knew cornerback was going to be a need, so I started asking about, hey, what's the thing that goes on with the likes of you know, corners that fit D'Amico Ryan's system. They said, you just need to watch Kamari Laster. Like, you just need to go ahead and watch Kamari Laster because that is plug-and-play edition. He is immediately going to flourish in this swarm mentality that they like of style. He's physical and press man coverage. He's great at the point of attack. He's not afraid to lower his shoulder. He can be a little inconsistent and grabby at times, but if you can work that out of you, you, you feel pretty good about the situation that you're going into. And he also is versatile. You know, the thing that really stood out about him was he's an Alabama native, kind of like D'Amico, but at the same time, he also played a variety of roles during his time at Georgia. You know, when D'Amico was there, he was an outside linebacker, then he shifted inside to inside linebacker, then he moved back outside to outside linebacker. Well, with Kamari, he started off playing in the nickel. Like, that was his first big job when he got to Georgia. And then he was helping that team to win a national championship. And then they decided, well, we really like Javon Bullard and we want to see what he can do on the outside. And we really like what we have with other guys like Keely Ringo. So we're going to try them around. So Kamari, we're going to move it to the outside. And immediately he flourished on the outside. And he was the number one cornerback in touchdowns allowed last season. So when I just watch him play, he is a lockdown corner. He has some inabilities when you ask him to play in zone coverage. But the thing that I think you like about him going to D'Amico's defense is they play a lot of man. They they love having those physical guys at the point of attack. They love attacking running backs and they want guys that are willing to be those type of players, which is where Lasser really shines. Everyone wants to talk about this four, six, uh, the four, six speed at the 40 time. I talked to some people around Georgia. They said it really wasn't that big of a deal. He was playing with kind of a bum foot. They, they, they knew about that going into the medicals. They, they felt comfortable with him uh, as a playmaker. And, and the big thing was they said that his play speed is bigger than his 40 speed. And there's always that like little bit of convoluted conversations that we always have where we have to sit down and say, listen, the film says one thing. The, the, the on-field metrics say another. What are we looking for? Do we want the film or do we want the numbers? Because you see those guys that will run a 4 2 9 40, like, like Xavier Worthy, run a 4 2 1, and you'll say, okay, well, that's really great. He's really fast, but what if he drops more passes than he catches? Is that good? Or would you rather have a 4 6 corner that is going to make surefire tackles, is going to be able to play a variety of positions, and immediately fill the gap of what's missing for this team, whether it be in the nickel or on the outside? And so, Lassiter and Kool-Aid McKinstry were the two that continuously came getting brought up in conversations. Kool-Aid went one pick before. And so when you saw Kool-Aid come off the board, it, it felt like in that moment, if they weren't going defensive line yeah. and there were some names that were available, but nothing that really stood out. You, you knew they were going cornerback. It, it felt like Kamari Lassiter was always going to be the pick. And, and lo and behold, now he gets to be that lockdown cornerback wherever he is for this defense long-term. And they love him down there. And, and I thought it was really funny that again, uh, and I was the guy that actually asked the question that went viral. He had no idea that D'Amico went to Alabama. And now it's like, oh, well, now we get to see in Georgia versus Alabama. I really hope that they have that rivalry inside that locker room. Uh, talk about the fact that, because you look at the secondary, we're taking a look at the rleds.com depth chart for the Houston Texans. And uh, you see now Lassiter's there. A matter of fact, uh, we can uh, throw Bullock into the conversation as well. Yeah. Uh, being that he was picked uh, in just about what 20 picks later uh, uh it was more so what was it uh 40 picks later 75 oh, was it 40 yeah he was 42 and 75 were the two so oh it was 75 maybe, okay 75. okay that's yeah. I, that, I wrote down the page number of that's that's just completely different <laughs> God. thank you for that um so yeah bullock really good size which you like about him what i like about him as well is is he's got the size he'll lay a hit uh he's got ball skills uh, he's a, he's a playmaker back there. And I know USC didn't have a great defense, but so what 
Um, obviously, they see something in them and talk about how when you put Lasseter back there, Bullock, Stingley Jr., and Petrie, that's a good starting point for a young secondary uh, as they're starting to, of course, you know, rebuild back there. We know Ward is getting on. Akuti, you just don't know about. But that's a good starting point with those four guys. It, it's it's a good starting point. I'll, I'll give you that. Uh, I, I think that when you have a Jimmy Ward, he still went on the field as a viable player that has that position flexibility. You know, the, the, the conversation is, well, what happens if Akuta struggles and Henderson struggles, but Bullock comes on and now you have three safeties and no nickel defender? Well, you can move Jimmy Ward down to the nickel in a contract year because if he's already played the nickel and he played the nickel for D'Amico Ryan's defense back in 2022. And a big deal for him was he didn't want to play the nickel, but sometimes if this is a shot for you to go to a, uh, to a Super Bowl, oh, for yeah. you to be a team that can actually hoist up a Lombardi trophy, you suck up your pride and you just fill a gap. So that could be the case, but Ward still is, I think a very highly successful playmaker. I want to see Jalen Petrie cut down on the missed tackle rate because of the thing that really stood out about him was year one, he was a great fit in zone. He had five interceptions last season. He had what one interception, if I'm not mistaken, but like he was really still struggling with the missed tackle rate. That was a problem back in Lovey's defense. That was a problem last season. If he doesn't have that, I mean, you got probably, I would say a top 25 safety in the NFL, maybe top 20 on a good day, because if he is a hard hitter and he is rangy and he can do a little bit of everything, Derek Stingley Jr., from, from people that you talk about, when he's healthy, is a top five cornerback in the making. But the problem is that he's got to stay healthy. He's missed 13 games in two years because of lower body extremities. And this was a lingering concern coming out of LSU. You know, he had the foot injury and then he also had the hamstring injury as a sophomore. So he's really only had one great defined season since coming out of high school, but he was an all SEC, all American freshman when he was there and he won a national championship. Like people yeah. forget he was the X factor for oh, that yeah. Miranda defense in 2019 when they went to the, when they went to the college football playoff, like yeah. he was the dude. And so, when he's healthy and he's on the field, he can be that guy, but he's just got to stay on the field and remain healthy. He's just got to be able to prove that he can be that difference maker. Kalen Bullock, you brought this up, Greg, he, he's a playmaker on the back end. He, he just, he, it's, it's like, it like the way that I would compare him is I remember watching a lot of Marcus Williams when he was coming out of Utah and I was just like, okay, this guy if he gets in the right system that allows him to play in coverage and they don't ask him to tackle and they don't ask him to go against the run and they just say, you know what? We're going to have you be a rangy free safety. He's going to be a stud. And I fell in love with this tape. And maybe it's because if I have this bias when it comes to uh, Kyle Whittingham, because Kyle Whittingham is the most underappreciated coach in college football <laughs> the last two decades. Sure. Get over it if you have any other opinion on this one. <laughs> yeah. But like, you then see he misses the tackle against Stefan Diggs, and it becomes one of the biggest highlight moments in the NFL history because of the, the Minneapolis miracle. And, and like that's where I have the same problems for Caleb Bullock because of you ask him to play in coverage, the dude yeah. is going to make a play. He is going to come up and he is going to make a highlight grab and he's going to take it back the other way for 15 yards and set you up inside the red zone for a really good three point differential, maybe even a touchdown. But if you're asking him to be the last man of defense, you have a better shot at closing your eyes than, than trusting him of just making a tackle. Like, like that's where there is going to be some concern. So it, the good news is, is that he's going to a defense that is going to teach him how to play tackle, like how to play tackle football to a team. Sure. That's what D'Amico Ryans does. If you do not know the fundamentals of football on defense, you do not see that field. He doesn't care how good you are in coverage. He doesn't care how good you are in man or zone. If you cannot do the sheer basics when it comes to making a play, you will not see the field. He's got to get bigger too. Like, like, like he is a stick. He is a twit. And I think yeah. that's not a problem. He also is not going to be in California where he's going to be. Like, <laughs> yeah. He's going to have not this vegan tofu every single night. Oh, yeah. He's going to be in Houston where there's great barbecue. There's great chicken. There's great seafood. There's great recipes to where he can bulk up a little bit. If he bulks up and he doesn't lose any of that speed and any of that catch radius, that is your long-term free safety. And then that's a good thing because of, I think that you have a better shot of letting a guy like Jalen Petrie play the strong safety role, even though both of them are kind of interchangeable Lasseter, again, he's that physical cornerback, whether you have him in the nickel, whether you have him on the outside. I think he's going to be a nice addition for this team. 
th- there's a foundation in the secondary. But what you really love is that even though there is a foundation with high upside in the secondary, I love the fact that you have a great front seven that is going to allow you to get to pressure the quarterback, that's going to allow these young cornerbacks and these young defensive backs to be able to continue to grow and develop and learn how to read double coverages, play against double moves. Because when you have a three-man set up front of Will Anderson Jr., Daniil Hunter, and Danico Autry, and then you could throw in Derek Barnett as a rotational guy, you're in a very nice spot. Because if yeah. it gives you opportunities just to get into the backfield and pressure a quarterback. And then I like the linebacker room. I do. I think Aziz Al Shair, I thought was the worst kept secret in the NFL that he was not coming to Houston. Like there are people who are like, well, what if he's like <laughs> yeah. stop, stop? He's coming yeah. to Houston. Like he proved last year that he was a good one, he was a good linebacker. He's coming to Houston. Like that was that was probably the, the the worst kept secret in the NFL, besides maybe like Derrick Henry going to Baltimore. Like, like that was so annoyingly obvious that he yeah. was coming here, but it's a good fit. It's a great fit. Absolutely. Christian, Christian Harris last year, he came on really strong. So you have a good front seven that I think is going to truly set the tone for you to allow these young players to make plays in the back end. And by the way, you bring up Christian Harris because uh, that was a player that just uh, who knows where he would be right now for us for the coaching change. Yeah. Uh, so just like you said, with Bullock, that's what, that's what, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to go in, evaluate kids, and say, yeah, the one thing though that's missing is say his tackling ability. Hey, we can handle that. We'll, we'll coach him up. Let's get that guy because he brings all the other traits to the table. We'll get him to be a more complete player. That's where coaching, scouting, and it all comes in together. And that's how you put a really good organization together. Now, speaking of the 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 rest of the defense, as far as the draft was concerned, um, a few of these other guys were drafted late. Uh, now Jamal Hill. Uh, yeah. This is one of the mystery picks, even though we know how fast he is for the position. But stats, stats wise, and just production wise, it's 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 not showing up. So why do they like him? And then, of course, talk about the other two guys that they added: Solomon Bird uh, in uh, the seventh round, and Marcus Harris also in the seventh round. One thing that those two guys have in common: uh, they both have high motors, and you're going to get a lot out of them, which is what you want from seventh round draft picks. So Jamal Hill is a really interesting case because of every person viewed him differently. And he was one of those weird players that you didn't know what he was going to be at the next level, which again is fine. But you got to remember, this was a guy that was a safety for three years in college. And then he was a safety at the start of the year at Oregon. And then they realized you're probably going to be a linebacker at the next level. So let's move you down to the line. We're going to put you on the weak side. You feel pretty good about where you are. You feel pretty significant about what's going on. But there were some teams that viewed him still as a strong safety, and there were some teams that viewed him as a linebacker. So his fit was really going to determine what he was going to play. It's interesting because of I don't think he's the exact same, but a guy that he reminds me a lot of, just based off of what I think could end up happening with him in Washington, is Jeremy Chin. Like, like Jeremy Chin was one of those guys that was supposed to be a safety, but then they tried him out at linebacker. They yeah. had him in the line of scrimmage, and they had him as the big nickel at times. Yeah, it's crazy. And, and, and maybe that's what you do with Hill, even though I don't think that that's probably the best course of action, because I think at this point you're just trying to make him a linebacker and a pretty good depth piece. But the part that really stands out is that he's great in coverage. You know, he he had one of the higher grades in coverage last year in the Pac-12 among weak side linebackers. He was a good run stopper. He's physical. He's willing to get his hands on the football. He's willing to get his hands on players in the open field. He's not. A, he's a relentless tackler. So there, there's upside with him. I, I think that's one thing that really stands out is that there's an upside with him in terms of what his play style can be. The question is how quickly can he adapt to playing full-time linebacker? I think that that's going to be a good thing. And and the part is is that as listed here on our lads, he's listed as the backup behind Christian Harris, which I think is a good thing because again, Harris right now is exactly what you want to see continue to bloom and blossom. And hopefully he's the next guy that turns into a Dre Greenlaw type opposite of a Fred Warner and Aziz Al Shire to where you have these two locked up under contract for the next three seasons and you build what D'Amico was already doing out in San Francisco, but they always have that sub third linebacker package. And, and maybe that eventually leads to that being Hill, kind of like Al Shire was, or kind of okay. like what Devondre Campbell is going to be moving forward in San Francisco is that third linebacker that can easily come up and make a highlight play and fill in in a pinch if injury happens. So yeah. 
I, I'm interested to see how they utilize him. It's the very start right now of uh, mandatory, I mean, a, a voluntary camp. You get to the very end of it. So mandatory camps coming up starting next week. So that's going to, I think, play a major role in us finding out a little bit more of where a guy like Hill fits. Training camp is going to give you a full-fledged avenue oh, yeah. and a full look of where this team is right now. And so to me, that's where you're going to figure out what Hill's actual role is. Is he playing more of a weak side linebacker? Is he getting reps in with the Mike? Is he getting reps in at the Sam? Is he pushing Henry Toa Toa? Are they moving Al Shair potentially to the strong side on certain plays and let Hill play the Mike? Like that's going to be really interesting there. Bird's a guy that is a veteran. Uh, he's a six-year player in college, started off at Wyoming, then moved his way over to USC. Uh, had a really good year last season at USC. Actually, one of the few bright spots on that defensive front. Maybe him and you could, I guess, argue Bear Alexander. I I mean, even I thought Bear had a bad season. Not the point. Point is, is that Bird's a dude that you want as a rotational guy. He's 23. So the rule with me when it comes to 23-year-olds, you get a certain number of reps to realize what you are in the next level. I think that when you look at Bird, you know already what he is. He's going to be potentially that third pass rusher or that fourth pass rusher. The guy that comes in when you take out maybe a, uh, maybe like a, um, sorry about that. Uh, maybe like a, a Foley Fodakowski. You take him out and you allow Nico Autry to kind of move inside to a two eye tech. And then you'll ship Will Anderson into the four tech like he was when he was at Alabama as a pass rusher. And then Bird's on the opposite side, Daniel Hunter. Like maybe that's what they utilize him for, which again is a good thing because you can never have too many pass rushers. And then let's talk about Marcus Harris. This was pound for pound, without question, my favorite pick the Texans made. Pound for pound. I love this pick. I think that when you get a really good run stuffer with high upside and a relentless motor in the pass rushing attack, who is a little bit undersized, but still has that forcefulness and the good lower body mechanics to win points of attack. And he did so in the SEC last year. He was an all-SEC defensive lineman. Like, that's something that D'Amico covets. Like, you look last season at Sheldon Rankins and Malik Collins. Neither is Vita Vea. Neither is one of these guys that's going to come on in and be a 370-pound man that just bulldozes and trucks people out of the way. What they're doing is they're using their agility as an asset and they're using their actual motor to kind of win the point of attack in lower advantages and then win upfield as a pass rusher up the middle. And that's where I think Harris can find a role for himself. I actually think by the season's end, if if he has a good camp, we're going to be talking about him rotating in with Danico Autry, rotating in with Foley Polikowski. Yeah. Probably somebody that gets 40% of the reps. And if you get 40% of the reps... It doesn't make you a starter, but it does mean that you are inching closer to that starting role. Now, again, he is, uh, I think, a big wild case right now for for his role because of a seventh-round pick. You don't really expect much from them throughout their entire NFL careers, let alone be starters in year one. But but there's just something about the fit here that makes so much sense. Like, uh, and, and, and just talking to him, you know, the way that he talks about learning underneath D'Amico Ryans is, I think, a huge blessing in disguise because if you're only going to see him grow and develop more yeah because i'm looking at the depth chart and it def- it does look like there's opportunity there for a player to get lucky maybe for whatever reason get additional snaps and if he's going to have that kind of motor we talked about especially during the summer he's going to try hard kid like that with a spot that looks like it's available because right now who do you consider the number three interior lineman, the true defensive tackle on the bench. Who is that right now? I don't know because of like right now you you don't really have that answer because Mario Edwards comes on over and he's played in both the three, four and a four, three. Do you trust him as a full-time third, third defensive lineman? Uh, How do you feel about Tim Settle coming on over? You know, I've talked to some people inside the locker room. They think that Tim Settle is a really, really good presence. But being a good presence is like being Rex Burkhead on this team. Like, yeah, it's cool, but like you're you're a championship caliber roster. If, yeah. if you don't have all the pieces in play, like you're not going to do anything. So it's this is one of those spots. And what's so funny is that Fidelius Payne is listed as a defensive end. And I get it because if he is a little bit undersized, but if they were to bulk him up just a little bit, move him out of like that 285 pound range, get him up to like 305. 
that's a dude as an undrafted free agent that could probably see some significant reps. Like I texted a couple of agents that were around the league on day three and they said, how the hell is he in Houston? And I'm like, well, they, they you know, free agent, you know, you know, Andrade. It's like, Cole, we know how this, how this business works. Shut up. Like you're an idiot. We, we get this, but why is he in Houston? He should have been a six round pick. Like they, they were flabbergasted that he went undrafted because if mm. he was just such a talented player, both at Nebraska. And then he goes over to the ACC at Virginia tech and he crushes it there in Brent Price system. So it's like, he's going to a team that is all about defense, that needs defensive line help, yep. that needs to be able to get better in the interior pass rushing department. If they can bulk him up and turn him into a bull rushing two down type of defensive tackle, I, I mean, you're adding in two guys that I don't know if they're full-time starters ever in the NFL. And I don't know if they'll even be, you know, more than rotational guys on second and third down, depending on what the scheme calls for and what they're trying to attack. But both Marcus Harris and Fidelius Payne are two guys that just scream to make a Ryan's type defensive lineman. And, and so I don't know if they will end up benefiting from playing in a team that needs some help. Khalil Davis last year, though, came on really strong after being at the UFL, uh, the USFL. Kurt Heinis worked his way on as an undrafted free agent and won over the respect of Lovey Smith and then won over the respect of D'Amico Ryan. So there's always a shot that maybe they start to get their reps up. I won't be shocked if Khalil Davis starts the year as that number three defensive lineman because that's what he kind of was coming in on late last year before they brought over Tyre Tart, who then didn't play in the postseason at all, but they just brought him in. He was a former starter at Tennessee. But I won't be shocked if Marcus Harris and Fidelius Payne see significant reps that they have good camps. I, well, I, I won't. I, I, I really mean, won't. If you look at it again – those are the young guys. Those are the those are the guys that they eventually, eventually, but they would like to speed the process up as fast as possible because those are young players that we're going to start with the franchise, learn with the franchise. Whereas some of the other guys we talked about, Settle and Edwards, I mean, been there, done that, a couple more years, they'll be out of the league. So I can see, and of course, we all know experience that has a lot to do with why some of these players make it. You could stash guys on the practice squad sometimes. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see that camp battle there. Payne, by the way, um, and before we move uh, over to the offense, Payne, would you consider him to be the best or only college free agent that they signed after the draft? That could I'm not gonna, be, you yeah, know, a yeah. kind of roster spot. Like, I'm not going to count out Tariq Barnes. I'm not going to count out Max Tooley because, yeah, they're, they're, they're players that could eventually, I think, find a home depending on what happens with the linebacker position in general. But Jacob Phillips, you would have to see another injury happen for him to make the 53-man. Uh, Neville Hewitt's too good on special teams to where they're going to cut him. So, like, like and, that, and that's Hewitt's thing is that – they resigned him not because if he's a great linebacker, but because if he's great on special teams. So they're not yeah. taking a roster spot for him. Deshaun Phillips is one that I think right now is probably a bubble player, but maybe if he has a good camp, again, he's one of those guys that's going to come on in and be a household name on special teams. So it's just based off a process of elimination when you look at position value. Payne's the one that makes the most sense, if there is one. Now, the thing is, is that also, you've seen this before all the time where they'll cut a player that they think is good enough to be on the 53-man roster, but maybe will fly under the radar off of waivers and they'll be able to bring him back on the practice squad, where they'll sign a player that is probably better suited to be on the practice squad, but they know if they release him, a team is going to pick him up off waivers immediately, so they're holding out hope for him, at least for now. That might be the case with Payne, where he's not good enough to be a starter week one. He's not good enough to be in the rotation week one. But they see some value there to where if they were to release him or they put him on waivers, somebody else is going to pick him up immediately. So that's one where I think that if I were to be a betting man, you can probably bring back Thule or Barnes on, on, the, on the practice squad where if Payne does anything, defensive linemen are valuable. Like, I mean, Greg, you, you and I see this all the time. You'll overdraft offensive linemen, not because of their good, but because of what happens if you lose a player. Like, oh, like yeah. what happens if your all pro tackle goes down? Well, you're screwed. Like, you're immediately screwed. So, 
you'll hold out hoping you'll get a third a guy that's probably a fifth round pick in the third round or the fourth round not because if you want him but what happens if a run starts happening and you're nowhere near the selection so it's smart to always have great offensive and defensive linemen. It's great to have depth. They're like like everyone focuses in so much on the wide receivers and the running backs and the yeah. tight ends and, and the corners. Yeah. And it's great. That's awesome. If you don't have a line to protect your quarterback and if you do not have a line that can rush a quarterback, you have freaking nothing. Yeah. You don't. You have to be great in the trenches. And if you're not great in the trenches, you're paddling upstream with styrofoam pads. That, that's what you are for the rest of the season. That's why I kept uh, trying to uh, convince Jet fans who are all into this uh, Brock Bowers draft pick. The Jets are not going with a tight end in the draft with all of the offensive line issues that they have had over the last few years. They're just not going to do it. They don't have a dumb It was the manager. dumbest argument. Like, I remember going on Jets podcast for like months and everyone was saying, well, Brock Bowers fits the system. It's like, great. Brock Bowers, like, 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 and they're like, well, look at the Joe Burrow situation that was going on. It's like, yeah, well, Joe Burrow basically said, I'm okay with losing my neck to get Jamar Chase because we have just such a great relationship. I'm okay <laughs> with basically selling my soul to the devil to get Jamar Chase on this roster. Because yeah. everyone at the time, even I think Bengals fans said, listen, Joe, we appreciate you and what you're going to be. <laughs> We need to protect you. Like that is like that is a necessity. And he's like, yeah. no, I just want to like. And by the way, everyone's like, well, we bring in Tyron Smith, but we bring in Chance to really, <laughs> yeah. Re really Tyron Smith. I know. You're, 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 you're gonna talk about a guy that right now has been dealing with injuries on and off for the last four seasons. Yep. You're gonna tell me right now. Oh, we're betting on him for 17 games no, with a quarterback that's coming off of a torn Achilles, mm -hmm. also in a crucial year for our staff if we think that we're going to be around in 2024. Yep. Shut up. Like, shut the hell up, Jets fans. Like, it was the most annoying thing. It was like <laughs> when I said that, that that Sauce Gardner was a perfect fit for a defense led by Robert Sala. But, but creating a quarterback is too high. Well, you got an all-pro. Like, like, yeah. like, 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 sometimes taking the move that is so easy to comprehend – is also the right one. And that's what I felt like when it came down to a guy like like getting the, an Olu Fashano. It's a sexy pick. It's what it is. And they get the fans generally to just drool all over Brock Bowers types players and things of that nature. But hey, you know what? Um, a lot of them, they got to learn. They're young. And, and this will be maybe the start of their learning process. Okay. Uh, let's move over to the offensive side and start first of all. Now, news came out. So Nico Collins gets the extension. Right. Um, how important was that? And when we take a look at this wide receiver room, I only mentioned that because I talked about nine picks in this draft and all uh, eight out of the nine were from different positions, but not one wide receiver. So yeah. this is like the spot that they did not worry about in the draft. Um, and that's obviously a very good thing. So all things considered uh, where they've been and where they are right now, the digs trade, uh, but anyway, Nico Collins, because this is also for, for fantasy football fans out there. Um, now that he has digs on the team, which is going to be a big help for him, um, how good – where is Nico Collins' ceiling? Do, do you think he's reached it yet? No, because, um, again, last year was his first fully healthy season, and he still missed 50, He still missed two games. Like So we're talking about a guy that has yet to play full season in the NFL. Yeah. And he got 80 catches while seeing Tank Dell take over games as well. Yeah. While seeing Dalton Schultz be a factor. While seeing Robert Woods get involved in the passing game. And then also you saw a little bit of Dario Ungumbo-Wale. And you also saw a little bit of Devin Singletary get involved in the passing game. So it's like there's definitely still a ceiling for him to reach. I don't know if he'll ever get to that 1,800-yard, 1,700-yard marker. I don't know if he'll ever be a top five wide receiver in the NFL. But... Top 10, no, there's a 100% a valid point. Top 15, I think that he's pretty freaking close to getting there. If not even, he's already there. Um, you look at his catch radius. I mean, I mean, the guy makes plays. He's able to weave in and out of traffic. He's got some really underrated speed that people don't talk enough about. I think also when you look at him, he's got some great, great ability to truck some people in the open field. And he has a great tracking mechanism. He does a good job of making plays. Hi, Brandon. Yes, Noah Brown as well. He also got really much involved. Um, but like <laughs> you, you look at 
uh, just what he is. The part that's really impressive about this deal is that people are going to say it's it, 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 for a guy that's only had one truly healthy season that $24.1 million is a lot of money. It is. It, it's a lot of money. That has the prices going up. And for a guy like Nico Collins, if he, if he stays healthy next year and this offense doesn't miss a beat and he ends up having similar numbers. So 1200 receiving yards, maybe 1300 yards, maybe seven touchdowns, but he averages still about 14.5 yards per play. And then you see C. Lamb get a deal, and you see Jamar Chase get a deal, and then T. Higgins gets a deal. Well, that asking price just has now expanded by at least $6 million annually per year. So now we're talking about a guy that is probably going from $24 million for the next four seasons, three seasons, on top of this year, where he is locked in still in the final year of his rookie contract, to now $30 million where that number is going to only continue to expand over time yes. because of yeah. it's what the market says. Yep. And so the fact that you were able to get this deal done, it's very smart by Nick Casario. It also, I feel like, had to get done because this is the first real pick that has hit in the Nick Casario era. <laughs> like, yeah, they've added in some players. Yes, they brought in some really good names. And yes, I do think that you look at Christian Harris moving forward and you look at potentially Derek Stingley moving forward. And I sure. think that you look at Juice Scruggs and you look at Tank Dell. They're all good players, but they still have a few more years before they even have to consider contract negotiations. Where this is a guy in your first draft class where you didn't have a first round pick, you didn't have a second round pick. You know for a fact that this guy that also you traded up for at the end of round three, you put yourself in the selection of, I know what I'm doing when it comes to drafting. I know what I'm doing when it comes to dishing out contracts. And I'm making sure that the guys that are buying into the system when we were awful, that yeah. trusted the game plan, they're here for the long haul. They're going to reap in the benefits. And yeah, everyone's going to say, well, what happens with Stefan Diggs? It's like, he's a one-year rental for now. What if he sucks? Or what if he's average and he doesn't get the money that you know he's actually looking for on the, on the market and he wants to stay and take another team-friendly deal? So it's like a one-year $9 million sure. contract or a one-year $12 million deal to stick around for another season. It's not impossible to think, but now you got your legit number one for the long haul. Yes. You don't have to worry about what comes next. And this is going to be a really smart ploy two or three years from now when you see some of the guys are getting sure. paid an egregious amount of money. And they probably don't deserve it. Like Calvin Ridley got $93 million this past offseason. $93 million is coming off as a, a coming off of a suspension. Most people would take Nico Collins over Calvin Ridley right now. Not just because of age, but oh, also, absolutely. Because, of, but also absolutely. because of what the yeah. upside is. Yes. And so when you see these type of deals get done, it's like, okay. And it's like, oh, but a max value of $75 million. You know that that max value means he hit every incentive yeah. in the process. Yeah. Which is a good thing for your team, which is Absolutely, a very yeah. smart thing for your team. So I don't see a problem with this. I think it's actually a really great deal on paper, and it's going to be a great deal in terms of resources five, six, seven years. I mean, uh, three, uh, two, three, four years from now. I, I really like the proactive approach from general managers when they say, you know what? I don't need to do this right now. I know I may be taking a little bit of a shot. But that's that's the business. You know, you have to evaluate whether or not the player you're giving a shot to is worth it. And if they yeah. believe Nico Collins is is that type of player, you know, maturity, all that buy in, like you talked about, this is the perfect guy. Do it now. So then you don't wait another year or however long. And then all of a sudden you're paying, like you said, you're paying twice as much because you you weren't sure and you waited just do it if you have to and pick the right guys to do it. And hopefully this is the right guy. And I agree. I mean, I see no reason to think that Nico Collins, why should you look at Diggs when you've got a guy who could be your number one and he's your homegrown guy. Uh, there's just, you know, it's, it's sometimes fans that get crazy about trades and they bring in these superstar type players and they get sucked in by it. Hey, look, you got one of your own, you know, just, just concentrate on Nico Collins before you go gaga on Stefan Diggs. So it's not even right. that. It's also just like you have Tank Dell signed to another two years after this one. So he's signed through 2026. You have Dalton Schultz signed through 2026. You have now Joe Mixon signed through 2026. You have your four main pieces there. And you also have Larry Tunkel signed through 2025. So you have your key pieces to go on a run for a while. Sure. And again, 
You still have your first round pick, the pick that you gave up to get Stefan Diggs for a one year rental that you voided the contract to only add 3.5 million to his deal for this season. You gave, you got that pick from Minnesota. So you didn't give up anything that you had. You gained a pick in the process with it. It was a late round pick, but you still gained a pick in the process with it. So you're rewarding the player that's been here for a while. Yep. You feel good about where you are. Potentially, this is a very good wide receiver draft class in 2025 to where if you were to lose out on a Stefan Diggs in the free agency, you can go ahead and replace him with a young talent on a five-year rookie contract. And you still have all the pieces in play to where you've made your decision. We're investing in a guy that showed us that he was worth investing in. And I think that solves a lot of the problems right there. Uh, by the way, Hutchinson, we talked uh, uh, about him, of course, last year and and the fact that here's a guy that could be a, a nice sleeper uh, late, late in the draft. Uh, what, and, and not everybody's going to develop like the way Tank Dell did. You know, it just doesn't happen. And not that Tank Dell had, um, uh, you know, a year like uh, what's his name from L.A. But um, uh, Punakua. Punakua. Yeah. But Hutchinson, what do you what do you still think about uh, him as a pro and whether or not he can still be a big part of their rotation in the next few years? There's a role a lot like the whole thing with wide receiver. I, I thought it was a knee. I, I thought it was a knee going into the draft. But then you add in Stefan Diggs and it kind of solves the need. So it's like, do you really need to draft a guy in round four, round two, round five? When you got a guy that you drafted in round six last year that at yep. one point was the all Big 12 leading receiver, was <laughs> yeah. an All-American. Yeah. I mean, let's also throw that in there. He he was an All-American. So yeah. so he had a really good, he had a really good college career. You have John Mechie that basically last year was his rookie season because of he was going through chemotherapy because of uh because of leukemia. So you're still seeing him develop. You still have Tank Dell on this team, you still have Nico Collins. You still have Stefan Diggs. Did you really need to add in a wide receiver? Like, no. like honestly, did you have to? No. no. So there's a role for Xavier Hutchinson. The question is, who's the odd man out? Because you see the roster right now. Nico Collins, Noah Brown, Xavier Hutchinson, Jared Wayne. Uh, uh, Stefan Diggs, John Mechie, Tank Dell, Ben Skoranek, who's a really good special teamer and was the special teams captain, and you traded for him. Robert Woods. And you also have Steven Sims that is a return man. Somebody's got to go. Yeah. Who is it? And I mean, the post-June first cut, it would make sense if it's Robert Woods. It would make sense if they were going to make an offer to potentially trade him to get him more reps elsewhere. It would. Yeah. But if you didn't cut him now, maybe you're not going to cut them. Maybe you're going to wait until the end of spring. I mean, until the end of, uh, end of training camp. So you're sitting here and you're saying, well, who's the odd man out? Who is it? So Hutchinson also has to have a really good camp. Mechie has to have a really good camp. And the good news is, is that like outside of Noah Brown, and the only reason why Noah Brown I think is safe is because of how much guaranteed money is going to be in the dead cap. Like okay. it would just, it just wouldn't make sense to sign him to a one-year deal and then cut him at the end of training camp. I mean, at the end of fall, uh, at the yeah, at the end of training camp. I say fall camp because I'm in college football mode, not the point. Um, but like it would be foolish to cut him when how much guaranteed money is attached to his contract compared to what would it would cost to cut Robert Woods, even if you think Woods is a better receiver. So maybe you just give up Robert Woods for a six round pick and call it a day to a team that loses their wide receiver. Like at the very end, like yeah. I thought, yeah. like, I, like I thought like the whole thing with, with Jacksonville cutting Zay Jones, it, it didn't make sense to me because of what's the harm of keeping him on the roster through training camp, knowing that there's going to be an injury at some point to where, yeah. I mean, like, you knew he wasn't going to be a part of your long-term plan. You probably know Robert Woods is not a part of your long-term plan. If you're willing to eat some dead cap just to get rid of his contract and have someone else pick him up and you get a sixth-round pick in return, and maybe you eat up more than 50% of the contract to get a fifth-round pick in return instead, you kind of win because of its building for your future, and he's not a part of your long-term future. Yeah. So the level of competition at wide receiver is really interesting. Like, you have your three elite guys at the front who also, any given Sunday, one of them can take over as the yeah. expert. Yep. Like, that's the beauty of this offense right now, uh, Greg, is that any single one of them can end up being that number one for a day. And everyone else has to kind of fall in line behind them. The question is, where does that next guy come in? And who is that next guy? 
Is it going to be Hutchinson? Yeah. Is it going to be Noah Brown? Is it going to be John Mechie? But that's a good problem to have. And in my opinion, that's sometimes what you really want is having that good problem. Do you think that they'll start using more 11 personnel? Or is... Yeah, it's interesting because they also added in Kate Stover. And yeah. like Stover to me it is still a very big work in progress when it comes to blocking. Yeah. I, I do think that his blocking skills right now are a little bit far fetched. Like, like people are vastly undermining them. I think that they're good enough to where if you wanted to run a 12 personnel look, you could. If you want to run 13 personnel look, he could hold his own. I don't think it's that, that bad. But also, why get a tight end that you figure out is going to have a really good upside and has a relationship with CJ Stroud when you don't utilize him? So, like that's the thing. Like, 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 like you have him listed here as the as tight end number three. Brevin Jordan is tight end number four. Keegan Quintoriano is tight end number two. By the end of training camp, I, I think Tegan moves all the way down to four. Stover is going to be fighting with Brevin Jordan for number two. And I think also what's really interesting about their roles is that they can emulate each other in different ways where you have a more stable version of just your traditional Y tight end with the Cade Stover. But in your H-back formation or as an F-back, you can utilize Brevin Jordan, who last year in a very similar role was kind of able to fill in with Andrew Beck in times and play of that off like off the radar kind of role, kind of like Justin Fowler did a few years ago coming out of Alabama when he was at Tennessee. Like you could see that type of role where they just do a little dink dunk passes off to him. So like eleven personnel, yeah, they're gonna run a lot of it, I think, because of what you have with all these wide receivers. But they can also run twelve. They can also run thirteen. They can also run spread. They can also yeah. run you know double formation out of the backfield. They can run a lot of different formalities because that they have the personnel to do it. And that's what makes you dangerous. Uh, you're yeah, not pigeonholed. Very dangerous. Yeah, because again, last year uh, they did not run a whole lot of eleven. But now, look at—I mean, just the fact that Robert Woods, when you're looking at him on the depth chart, is where he is. When just last year he was starter, he was right there starting in the slot. Now he's trying to barely make the team. Okay. Yeah. Um, offensive line. So Blake Fisher goes round two. Uh, we know he's got a lot of experience playing at Notre Dame opposite all um, seems to have already, you know, things that you want to be, a, 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 you know, a fit in place kind of guy, as far as pro body and all that. Um, do you think that, well, let's just put it this way. Would it surprise you if he was not starting week one? Would it surprise me? Yeah. He's not starting week one. Okay. No, he's not. No. The only way he is starting week one is if Titus Howard gets hurt. I that, so, that that's it. Because so, Titus is gonna be, I think, your starting right tackle. He will. going okay. into the year. I, I I think so. I think that they're not ready to give up on Kenyon Green just yet. What I will say is Jared Patterson got reps at guard last year. Juice Grunks got reps at guard last year. There could be this three-way conversation with them, plus then you throw in Kendrick Green, who's at right guard, that could play left guard, where there's going to be a battle in some formation where you're hopeful because of one was a second-round pick, the other one was a first-round pick, that Scruggs ends up being your starting center with Michael Dieter gone, and then you get Kenyon Green back as your starting left guard. Because if you have the investment in them and you trade it up for one, and then one's a first-round pick with a fifth-year option that you got to worry about which then means that you probably have Titus Howard back at right tackle. And, and that's the good thing because the, I'm sorry, like from when you watch him and, and Texans fans know this as well as I do, they're not ready to give up on Titus Howard whatsoever. The injuries are starting to stockpile to where it's becoming a little alarming, but they know he's a right tackle. He's not a guard. He, he As much as people are going to try to force him into playing guard, as much as they'll say, well, he could play guard in a pinch, it's not a pretty side. You know what it reminds me of sometimes? And that's not an insult to Titus. Titus is a really good overall right tackle when he's on the field. But it's like watching a car wreck that you know is going to be brutal and you can't take your eyes off of it. And you're driving <laughs> by, you're like, ah, oh, God, yeah. just, I, I, I can't watch. But you kind of have to. That's sometimes watching Titus Howard play guard. When you put him at tackle, he's like, there was a game last year where he played left tackle and he looked better at left tackle than he looked at left guard. And he filled in that guard because if they need him as a veteran to step up, but I think that he's a tackle. Like, I think that he is best utilized as a tackle, right tackle, left tackle, whatever it may be. Fisher's one of those dudes that I think is built for the long haul. I think that they, that's why they used uh, the, the number 59 pick on him was 
they understand that right now, last season, when you look at all the injuries that came to the offensive line, mostly at left guard, it was mostly Kenyon Green, then Kendrick Green, then Jared Patterson gets hurt, and then Titus gets hurt. They want to be able to have that flexibility to where if Laramie goes out for a game and they got to move Titus over from left right tackle to left tackle, they feel good about where they are with their development tackle. The same thing can be said about when it comes to if they got to move him inside for a game. Well, now they feel good at Blake coming in and playing right tackle. Maybe you have to go ahead and play. Maybe you lose Laramie for a game and you try Blake at left tackle. Like that's the reason why they brought him in to be that swing developmental tackle. Okay. That probably is going to be here past 2024. Like this is a major year for Titus. He's got to prove that he can stay on the field. Number one and remain healthy, but he also has to prove during his time when he, I mean, he's also got to prove that he is still worth the investment. Cause remember last Sorry. season he was going into camp and he didn't have a contract. He didn't like, 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 like Titus was going into the end of his rookie deal and then the day before training camp, the, the, no, the day of training camp starts, three-year, $56 million extension. So that extension kicks in this year. And so now they can get out of the opt-out where they won't have to pay an egregious dead cap hit next season. Okay. So he's going to prove that he can stay on the field and remain healthy. But if he does, I think he's a good tackle. And then okay. a year from and then a year from now, the best part is, is that if you wanted to, you could cut him and the dead cap money will even be less next season. I mean, after 2025 and then Blake Fisher comes in and now it's year three. And now he's got two years of learning this offense underneath Bobby. Okay. Slark, right. And now he's your right tackle for the future. So okay. I think that it was a very smart investment pick by Nick because if he understands, again, you have a young quarterback. The last thing we can do is have the quarterback that Deshaun Watson was. I know we don't usually say his name around Houston for a lot of fans, but Deshaun got killed. Like he did, their offensive line was a turnstile for years, which is why they threw two first round picks in to get Laramie Tunsil. They were tired of seeing their quarterback get hit. Yeah. And so instead, when you look at what you have now with a guy in Blake Fisher, he can be that option in case of injury, whether it be okay. to Kenyon Green, whether it be to a Shaq Mason, yep. whether it be to a Laramie Tunsil, because Titus is interchangeable in positions. He's best at right tackle. He is best at right tackle. Oh, yeah. But when you look at Blake Fisher, what it does is it allows you to have that position flexibility if Howard's got to move spots. I, I, I And again, we talked about with the Jets, and I got no problem with that, obviously. And that's the way you have to think, especially when um, you have an organization that has had the amount of issues, the amount of injuries, the amount of underperformance at a position, especially as important as offensive line. You will take a player like Blake Fisher for that reason, like you just said. Hey, he may not even start until 2026, but he just provides you with the ability to sleep at night. And that's very important Absolutely. now in the NFL. That's the main thing. Yeah. Uh, Ladarius Henderson. Uh, you look at him as uh, somebody that should be able to make the roster because of his um, flexibility and experience. You know, he's, he's really a more of a run blocker type he's, he's definitely got a ways to go as a pass pro but the fact is he's got a lot of experience uh, playing in you know, a big competition um i see no reason to think he can't make the team with his uh ability to play multiple spots make the team probably i i mean well, the seventh round pick again like seventh yeah. round picks it's basically I don't like him and anything else other than make the team i'm a michigan fan i know yeah, what he no. does yeah well, it was like everyone was just like, well, well, what happens if you need him to play tackle? I'm like, please. Oh, please you're in stop. big trouble. I say, please, <laughs> please stop. Yeah. I, I watch Michigan's line. Like, yeah. I, what was it? What was it? Hold up. You're a Michigan fan. You know this off the top of your head. I It has been a day and a half. Um, Was he a part? Did, did Michigan win the Joe Moore Offensive Line Award in 2022? Because I know they didn't win it last year. No, they didn't win it last year. They won it in 2023. I, th I don't know if they won it back to back years, but those were the two years that they had their best lines. And I 2021 was, and 2022. 2022, right? actually. Yeah. 2023. Yeah, 2021, last 2023. year, they didn't. Yeah. No, Washington won it last year. Yeah. But like, so Henderson was a part of that team that was, that won the national championship, but he wasn't a Joe Moore award winner. Correct. And like, he's not a tackle. Like, he really wasn't a tackle when he was coming on over from Arizona to say as a transfer. Like, he was a guard that everyone knew was going to be a guard. Yeah. 
he's going to run. And again, if you, if you're to me right now, what's going to separate a guy like Ladarius Henderson making the active roster or the 53 man practice squad is can he be an efficient run blocker because oh, of, because, yeah. because you know what happened? You know, you, you talk about Blake Corum, you talk about Tom Edwards, you talk about even JJ McCarthy having the running room ability from the left tackle spot last year in Ann Arbor. There's a sense of optimism like that. If he can provide that, this was one of the worst running rushing attacks in, in the NFL last year. I mean, they averaged outside of Devin Singletary. They averaged, what was it? Um, 3.1 yards per play. That's not going to cut it. Like everyone yeah. knows that, 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 that that's not going to cut it. Yeah. So you have to say to yourself, well, what happens now when we go and we get the right guy in the building? Can we get somebody that can easily be an efficient opener of lanes and if Henderson can do that and get some running room for both Damian Pierce and get some running room for Joe Mixon, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't see why he can't make the active roster. Look at the guys there he's going to be fighting up against. Uh, Dieter Eastlin, Nick Broker, Jalen Thomas, J uh, Kendrick Green, who, yes, they traded for last season, but he's going into a final year of his contract. He also was injury prone during his time in Pittsburgh and then was injury prone last year. David Sharp, where you don't need to have three tackles. You're not getting rid of Fisher. You're not getting rid of Howard. So are you getting rid of Charlie Heck? What is his guaranteed money for this year? Yeah, there's an argument to say that depending on injury and depending on how much progression you get with Kenyon Green, do you make any trades? Henderson, if he can be a good run blocker, is going to be a is going to be a fit in terms of depth piece. But that, but that's really it. That's like, it. Yeah. like, like when you talk about seventh round picks and Jeff, you know, I mean, Greg, you know this as well as I do. Sorry, again, I'm exhausted. Um. But like when you know this as well as I do, sometimes you just take a seventh round pick on a player that you know that you just didn't want to play against them. Like that's it. Like it, like they're they're not there because if you didn't want to draft him, it's because of well, it, it let's say Tennessee drafts him and he ends up panning out. Crap! Now we got to play him four times. I mean, now we got to play him twice a year for the next four years. Yeah, not. happens. So it's sure. like sometimes yeah. just take away a player that maybe fits for another offensive line because if you just don't want them to go ahead and land. I mean, I think it's a good fit, again, I, especially because, again, that whole left guard deal, especially if Howard does play right tackle, which he should, as you're saying, that does become an open spot. And yeah. I do believe Henderson, um, that is his strength, is is being able to uh, play the run game over the pass game. So we'll see. I think it's a good fit, um, again, just to make the roster. Okay. Um, and then the last pick <clears throat> of the draft that we want to talk about is Jawar Jordan. Yeah. And – uh, getting him in the sixth round, um, he's got uh, the kick return ability with the two kick returns uh, when he took over that role with Louisville the last few years. Is that the primary reason he's here, uh, just to be special teams, kick returner, or do they see something more in him? You mean uh, for Jar Jordan? Yes. I just keep him as special teams. Like, honestly, well, like, like to me, that's like, that's where it, you have more competition when it comes to wide receiver because if Steven Sims right now has got to make the roster in some capacity as a special teamer. But what if there's not a home for him at wide receiver and Jawar Jordan just balls out as a special teamer and he becomes a punt returner and he becomes a great kick returner. And yep. then he offers something as a pass catcher on third down as a running back like he did when he was at Louisville. I loved him at Louisville. I, I really did. Like, like I remember watching his film when he was at Syracuse. And I was like, eh, you know what? He's He's got some a little bit of torque to him. There's a little bit of juice in the open field. And then he goes into Jeff Brom's offense this year. And like literally everybody, like there's a kid that's going on over this year. And I don't mean to get, get off subject, but like Colin Lacey, he's uh, from South Alabama. He's now going over to that offense. And like Jamari Thrash came on over and Isaiah, Isaiah, Isaac Garinato came on over and Jamar Jordan was there. And they all just hit in this offense. They were so explosive. And you got to see them light it up in the ACC. And I think that that's what you're trying to get with Jordan right now, is a guy that can be that explosive playmaker and that firecracker in some capacity. And I think that right now the biggest hole for him is going to be on special teams. They need a long-term punt returner because Desmond King, what's the value of keeping him around if he's not going to be a starter in the nickel? And you get somebody that can go ahead and elevate your status. You also saw where last season you got a little bit of Steven Sims on punt return. And you get a guy that can be on a rookie contract for the next four years. Yeah. Carve out a really nice role. Be cost-friendly. Allow you to spend money elsewhere. Maybe you feel like you need to have more depth on special teams at I don't know, cornerback than you do at wide receiver. 
And so it allows you to maybe move off of players that are no longer a part of your long-term system. So for Jordan, to me, the thing that really stands out is that he can be a decent runner. He was good after contact in the ACC last year. He played against some really quality defenses, but it's a special team factor. And again, when you have that type of speed that allows you to win in the open field, the elusiveness to cut and break tackles, it's warranted to go ahead and keep a roster spot. And I, I thought that when you bring in a guy like him, you automatically have a role. You don't know what it is maybe sure. yet. Maybe, maybe you don't have to announce it to us. Maybe it's a third down pass catcher. Maybe it's a second and short type of role. Maybe it is just special teams. But yeah. when you're adding in a guy like Jordan, you know that there's a role for him automatically on this team. And the, 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 the roster, uh, the depth chart is there for the taking. Yeah. He, he could take that number three role from this team oh, yeah. if he has a really good camp. So um, it makes a lot of sense. Okay. Uh, a couple more things before I let you go. You mentioned pain on defense. Uh, give me, if, if there is, is there a player, one of these rookies that they signed on offense that uh, could fight for a roster spot or be valuable at some point in the next year or two after playing in the practice squad. It's hard. It, it, it's cause, cause like so nobody, British, nobody just jumps out. No, because like okay. British Brooks, he, he split reps behind Omari and Hampton last year at North Carolina. So he's really going to have to prove himself in camp. Both the, uh, bo- uh, both the J, uh, the, uh, the, the Janky brothers from South Dakota state, the, the, you know, it's great that they're coming into Houston. <laughs> it's great that they're, they're yeah. really good route runners. I, I don't mean to, I don't mean to strike to, uh, to stipe them at all. They're, they're really good route runners. Um, one of their teammates just landed somewhere that I was just doing a video on him talking about him, uh, at when he was at, uh, and he just transferred to a power four school. I'm blanking on who it is. Not the point. Point is, is that they added in like, like both of them were really good at the SCS level. But but where's the room for them at wide receiver in Houston right now? Because you got your big three. You then have your next three that are probably going to make the roster. And you're fighting with six other guys, two of which are proven for the seventh roster spot. Yeah. If they want to carry seven wide receivers. So Jared Wayne was a guy that a lot of people really liked last year. And they're okay. probably going to do whatever they can to keep him around on the practice squad. Steven Sims, if he makes the team, he's making it for special teams. Xavier Hutchinson, I don't think he's going anywhere. Johnny Johnson may be released, but then brought back on the practice squad. So, like, they're really battling up field against some great wide receivers right now. So, it's hard. Like Practice squad, that's what it it is. And even then, like, you still have to think that, is Wayne going to take a step back? Is Johnson going to take a step back? Sure. What if Xavier Hutchinson goes uncleared off waivers and you want to bring him back? And, and so are you going to say that you're giving up on him? Probably not. So it's like, that's where the problem resides, that they, they're they good players. They just came to a team that really doesn't have a weakness this year at wide receiver. Uh, do you, how, did you give them a grade? No, I didn't. Okay. I, 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 there wasn't enough for me to be able to go off of watching them. No, I mean a uh, grade for the team. Oh. For the draft. Oh, yeah, uh, B+. Plus. I give him B plus. Um, okay. I liked it. Like Nick, the, the thing with Nick that does that is, I don't want to say it's bothersome because they, they landed good players. They did. They, they landed really quality players. I love the Bullock pick. I love the Harris pick. I absolutely love the Marcus Harris pick. Um, I like the Jordan pick for special teams, but like, do, do you remember like last year, how many trades Nick made? Like he, he had a That's franchise true. record of eight trades. And then, you see Cooper DeGene available. You see Kool-Aid McKinstry available. You see these guys that were still getting in line to where maybe you could have moved up to add one of them that would have been a great addition on the outside versus the inside for Kamari Laster. And I'm not saying anything negative about Kamari because I think Kamari is a really good fit for this defense. But there could have been a little bit more aggressiveness to add in a uh, to add in a corner. There could have been a little bit more aggressiveness to add in a defensive lineman. There could have been a little bit more aggressiveness to trade up. And he did to go get Cade Stover, which I think you can appreciate. But like knowing Nick's draft strategy over the last few years, you kind of knock him just because of, well, he didn't do what he always does. And that's not a problem. Sometimes you got to go outside the box to be able to make some moves. But at the same time, this was one where maybe you want to go get a little bit aggressive. Every pick also that I look at, 
there's one guaranteed starter week one in some capacity. It's Laster. Everybody else, it's just like, yeah, maybe Kalen Buck starts. Yes, Brandon, I know. Kalen Buck was a trade-up. My apologies. I forgot about that one. Um, yeah, uh, maybe maybe he's a starter. Uh, maybe you'll see Marcus Harris play more significant reps. So it's like, it's a good thing because of what you did in free agency. Like, 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 like for me, the Texans won in free agency. That's where they made most of their money this offseason was getting the right players in with Daniil Hunter, Aziz Alshair, trading to go get a, a, a really good fit for this offense in, um, in, in Joe Mixon, trading to go get Stephon Diggs. I actually don't mind the Jeff Okuda signing. I think that, that giving him another shot. Danico Autry is another one that I think is going to be a really good player in a limited role, however you want to utilize him. Yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah. They won in free agency. So they didn't yeah. need to win in the draft. So when you take their entire offseason grade and put it together, they're they're probably about an A minus, maybe even an A to some people, which again is really good. The question is, is that what is good? Is good enough for you when you look at what Tennessee did this offseason, what Indianapolis did this offseason, what some other teams did this offseason throughout the AFC? Is good good to where, yeah, you're gonna be in the playoffs and you're gonna maybe make it to the divisional round, and maybe you'll make it to the AFC championship game, or is this good to where you are taking that next step forward? And to me, when I look at the schedule, when I look at the roster, when I look at what you have internally, you're about a 10, 11 win team, 10, 11 wins is good enough to get to the playoffs. That's for damn certain. And their schedule does them no favors, like at all, especially when you look at like, like that week, like December, what is it? 19th. Is that when they play Miami, uh, December 15th? 15th through the end of the season is brutal, in my opinion. Because if you got the 10 games, yeah, you got the the three games in 10 days. And then you also have Tennessee, which I think Tennessee at that point will be playing for maybe a playoff spot and you may rest your starters. So none of those games are guaranteed wins. You do get the bye, which I can't appreciate right before that stretch. Yeah. But you also have more more games on on primetime. 11 and 6 is very plausible, but 11 and 6, like, like, the biggest lie that we tell ourselves, and this is the thing that I've said on multiple podcasts recently, the biggest lie we tell ourselves is you are what your record says you are. No, it's not. <laughs> no, no, it's not. No, no, it's not. You're really going to tell me that, and this happens in college football all the time. You're really going to tell me that an 11 and one Boise state versus an eight, and four, <laughs> yeah, right. uh, an eight and four LSU team there. Boise state's better. No, sure. it's not. The same yeah. thing goes in the NFL, the 31st ranked schedule versus yeah, the, the schedule. Yeah. Ranked Throughout the toughest schedule, yep. one goes 13 and four, one goes 10 and seven. You're really going to tell me that those teams are evenly matched? Give me a break. Like, but the problem is with, te- with, with the Texans is that they have an, easy, an easier stretch that I think people want to give them credit for at the beginning of the year. Indianapolis, Chicago, still implementing Caleb Williams, yeah. Minnesota, uh, Jacksonville, New England, a Bills team that I think is going to be really, really hit and miss at times. It's also going to be a Stefan Dix revenge game. Like they could be six and zero going into green Bay. Like, and it wouldn't shock me in the slightest. And then you got that stretch of games where it's New York on Thursday night football and they got Monday night football. And then you got Thursday and Sunday night football with, I, I mean, uh, I don't understand why they do that. I just, don't. it's weird. It's, like, like the, the way their schedule is built out. So it's like, there's a shot that they could end up having like the, that, that stretch of games where they win a lot. And they win big, and then you go ahead and you talk about where this team is, um, uh, and then you talk about where this team is at the end of the year, and maybe they lose some games. Like they're going to be a very, I think, intriguing team because of you look at where their schedule bodes. They got they look really, really good at one point, and then they start taking some steps back. They they could, but that doesn't mean that they're a bad team. It just means that they're playing against teams that maybe have a little bit of an easier stretch. Yeah. Well, look, it's. Um... Well, first of all, their schedule this year is North NF- NFC and East AFC. Correct. Yeah. Hang on, hang, hang on, Greg. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna make this abundantly clear. Brandon JJ Watt is not coming back. JJ Watt is not coming back. I'm going to say this as clear <laughs> as day for everybody to hear because of I am sick of this gripe. And this malarkey. (laughs) Here's the reason why J.J. Watt's not coming back. If he comes back, that means that your entire defensive line is hurt and nobody on waivers is coming in. 
which means you're not going to be a playoff team, which means Watt is not coming back to play for a team that's not going on a postseason run. He's not coming back. It's over. It's a pipeline dream. And it's the dumbest thing that we said. He would only be back. No, no, he's not coming back, Brandon. He's not coming back. Everybody, he's not coming back. Say it with me. J.J. Watt is D-O-N-E like 1970s disco. He is done. He is done. He is done. He is done. And what yes, again, even- thank you, Danny. He doesn't even fit the Texans' D. He doesn't fit the scheme. And you know what? Maybe he could because if he's lost some weight. But even then, he doesn't fit what was being run for years in Houston. 3-4 as a defensive end. How did this even become a story? Because if he said at a softball game, if D'Amico needs me for, you know, if D'Amico needs me as a last interest resort, uh, I, I'll, I'll come back in. This is my last year because I'm staying in football shape. This is my last year where I'll stay healthy. But it would have to be meeting all these logistics. And then okay. everyone decided to run with it. Because if it's right. J.J. Watt. Yeah. Because it's J.J. Watt. Okay. Wow. Um, okay. So that is going to wrap it up a little lively way to end up, which is what I like. We ended it like we started it. Um, now, uh, you've got your channel, as I mentioned, so you can I check do. that out. Uh, Mr. Cole Thompson. Yep. Uh, and, uh, what else do you have as far as content? Where, where can people find, uh, your written work? So you can check me out at texanswire.com. We talk every single day Texans. Tomorrow we got back to voluntary OTAs. So that is, again, another major asset. Uh, I'm finishing up my series this week. Actually, next week I'll finish it up because I still have to finish up with a few more things. Uh, Ranking every single position in the NFL based off of players. We've already done linebackers where Aziz Alshair was in the top 20. We had running backs where Joe Mixon was in the top 20. I got wide receivers dropping tomorrow because of the Nico Collins extension. So where does he rank among top receivers? Where does Tank Dell rank among the top 64 receivers? Uh, I did an article that people got really pissy about because of I didn't rank CJ Stroud at number seven. I mean, I, CJ Stroud was ranked number seven and Dak Prescott was number six. Those weren't my rankings. Those were the rankings of everyone combined, not me. Okay. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm saving that one. So <laughs> I'm going to rank my quarterback rankings. Spoiler, TJ Stroud is not top five, so get over it, Texans fans. I don't really care. He's not top five after one season. Uh, but we got news coming out tomorrow from uh, highlights from OTAs. Uh, next week is the start of mini camp. So if you want to check out all my great work, you want to check out all of our great work at Texans Wire, it's at TexansWire.com. If you like college football, really, if you love college football, I, I talk college football every single day on my own YouTube channel. So at Mr. Cole Thompson, it's the exact same as my YouTube handle. And if you want to go ahead and follow me on Twitter, it is at Mr. Cole Thompson. So that's where you can check out everything. Awesome. Cole, it was great talking Texans football with you once again. And for any of those uh, Texans fans out there, we'll close by, uh, again, reminding you to get the uh, draft guide. This is it. 2024 draft guide. Again, seven of the nine uh, scouting reports are right in here from the Houston Texans. And the draft review guide is coming out real soon. So a lot of what we just talked about today will be in here. And then I'll share my own thoughts, of course, as well on the Houston's draft. And it's a review on, of course, all 32 teams. So check that out at rlads.com and subscribe here on the rlads YouTube channel if you want to know what's going on. Because we are right now, matter of fact, tomorrow we're doing our scouting on the Big Ten. We've already started with the SEC. And these are players to keep an eye on for the 2025 draft uh, and also for college football this season. So um like you cole i love talking college football and so uh this is just the start of it so who do you um, got who do you who do you have right now as the number one quarterback in the sec i'm genuinely curious who does our lads have yeah who does our lads have who did uh beck is it Beck? okay yeah as long as it's not quinn ewers i no I, no okay as long as it's not quinn here's the thing yeah. brandon here's the deal follow me on tw- follow me on 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 my youtube channel at mr cole thompson if JJ Watts on the roster. I'll pay you twenty five dollars. Follow like me right that. now on YouTube. If JJ Watts on the roster week one, I'll sell you twenty five dollars, and you can go ahead and make comment on my own YouTube channel. Uh, it, it, and it's here. It's legit. There you right go. Right there. I'm saying. Just put a twenty five bucks. Just put a two over there. Five. Twenty five bucks. Right yeah. There you go. Thanks, Cole. Anytime. Enjoy Greg. your vacation. I believe me. I will. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Take, Take care, care man. Buddy.